The spirit of Alaska is unique, combining all for the untamed majesty of nature, a rugged individualism, and strong traditions of mutual aid. People still come to Alaska seeking adventure and a chance to test their mettle in the wilderness. Good people like Chuck Heath. He had arrived in hunting and fishing, but actually hit the trifecta. He got the adventure he yearned for, and he earned his master's de degree in education, and pay raise to boot. The state of Alaska was paying a premium $6,000 a year, more than twice what he was paid in Idaho, to attract more teachers. So Chuck and Sally Heath packed their bet packed up their three babies, boy that'd be bad if I said packed them. Wait, packed up their three babies. All under the age of 28 months. That's just a little, that's just a really bad choice of words. Packing up your babies? Whatever. And headed north to Alaska on the adventure that became their life. In those days it was unusual for an entire family to pull up stakes and relocate to the last frontier. Unless you were a member of multi-generational Alaskan nature native family like my husband Todd's. It was usually the family breadwinner who trekked north to seek adventure and job opportunities, while the nuclear family remained in the safe, known confines of the lower 48. Five years after Mom and Dad piled our six-person clan to blue 1964 Rambler, barged it onto the ferry of the Aklon Alkin Highway and drove us to Canada into Anchorage and a new chapter of the Heath family life. What the hell is she talking about? I'm completely lost. Chapter 3 of Chapter 1 We moved into a duplex 15 miles outside of Anchorage so that Dad could teach at Ch Chugiak Elementary School in a town that was a little smudge off the map outside the state's biggest city. Mom worked part-time as the school lunch lady at Eagle River Elementary School. I love the fringe of benefit of her bringing home leftover homemade rolls from the cafeteria. She later became our school secretary. My first clear memory of school was when my kindergarten teacher wheeled a black and white television into the classroom so we could watch American astronauts land on the moon. The lunar landing happened in July 1969, before school started, but even watching taped images of an American wa walking on the moon stirred me into an overwhelming pride into our country, how we could achieve something so magnificent. A similar feeling stirred into me as my class recited the Pledge of Allegiance. I felt proud and tall as we pledged our hearts every morning. Early on, I gained great appreciation for the words we spoke. The United States of America, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I knew those words held power. And not just those words. I developed a love of reading and writing early on. Leaning on Mom's shoulder at the new pew in the church and the wild wood during the Sunday sermon, I heard the password, pastor use the word different. I can spell different, I excitedly whispered in her ear and scribbled it in the margin of the church bulletin. It was my first big word, and I was so proud to have figured it out by myself. There's so many jokes I could put here, but if I do, we'll be here forever. <sighs> it was the first time my mom didn't give me her stern don't talk in church look, but instead she smiled warmly and seemed as proud as I was. What the hell is she going with this? Reading was a special bond between my mother and me. Mom always read aloud to me, poetry by Ogden Nash and Alaskan writer Robert Service, along with snippets of prose. She would quote biblical proverbs and ask me to tell her what I thought. She found clever ways to encourage my love of the written word by reading cookbooks and jokes out of readers like Jot Reader's Digest together and reading letters to grandparents. My siblings and I were better athletes. My siblings were better athletes, cuter and more sociable than I, and the only thing I had to envy about me was the special passion for reading that I shared with our mother. If you had this big passion for reading, then why is it that you don't read newspapers or magazines? I, I think she's making this stuff up, but whatever. Who we all thought were ranked up somewhere with fame, the female saints. And the V... The, VFW announced that I won the plaque in its annual flag poetry contest for my third grade poem about Betsy Ross, Mom treated me like the new Emily Dickinson. Years later, I won the Patriotic Group's annual college scholarship. She was just as proud. My appetite for books connected my school teacher father and me too. For my 10th birthday, he sent me the wonderful Wizard of Oz, and my dad read it to us that night. I appreciated it even more realizing he spent all day teaching elementary school, coaching high schoolers, and then came home, no doubt, 
a bit tired of kids. We still only had one old Rambler card. We walked in everywhere in our small town, even on icy winter days. Our big trips were out in Anchorage. On those rare occasions we sing, Ain't no mountain high enough. Okay, I'm not going to sing. I'm really sorry I put you through that. And tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree on the scratchy AM radio. Shut your ears, Dad would holler when the news came on. Shut your ears? What? As the news came on, in case a sports score was broadcast that would ruin next week's game for us. We avoided sports page, too, so we wouldn't spoil the NFL games. We didn't get to watch until a week after they played, because television and broadcast were tape delayed in Alaska's early days. There was no need to drive to town often, because Mom sewed a lot of our clothes, and we shopped for some via mail order through the Sears catalog. Where the hell is she going with this? I know I keep saying this, but... What does this have to do with her political memoir? I'll be back, people. I need another break. Alright, I'm back. Sorry, I just needed some time to let my brain recover from the pile-up mush it was becoming. Or was I? It wasn't common in Alaska to have many fresh fruits and vegetables from the lower 48, and transportation costs drove food prices through the roof. So a lot of what Alaskans ate, we raised or hunted. Moose, caribou, partimigan, or... Again, I'll just put that in a caption and let you guys figure out what it means. And ducks. Dad and his friends became their own small game taxidermists. Even today, my parents' living room looks like this natural history museum. And when an earthquake hits, Dad can tell the magnitude by how fast the tail wags on the stuffed cougar that crouches out on a shelf over the big picture window. Oh, oh crap. Yeah, I just remembered what I was reading. Oh, dear. When we were kids, we raised chickens, caught fish, and dug for clams. In summer, we picked wild berries, cranberries, and raspberries. We grew, pro we grew produce like carrots, lettuce, and broccoli, but never could compete with the world record-setting cabbages like you see at the Alaska State Fair. The 2009 cabbage winner at Valley Farmer, who grew a 127-pounder, twice as big as Piper. Thank you for sharing that, Palin. That's so important to your story. We usually baked our own bread and drank powdered milk that was sold in big red and white carnation boxes. In so many ways, Alaska is a playground. When the lower 48 parents tell their kids, go play outside, there may be a limited option in suburban backyards. But Alaska kids grow up fishing in the state's three million lakes in the summer and racing across them in the winter on snow machines, kicking up rooster tails of snow. We hike, ski, sled, snowshoe, hunt, camp, fish, fly. We have the highest number of pilots per capita in the United States. In Alaska, we joke that we have two seasons, construction and winter. Hey, no! That is Chicago's, that is Chicago's joke. You stole that from Chicago. <sighs> Sorry, I, I, I am a resident of Illinois, and we say that all the time. I am not giving Palin credit for that one. As I grow older, it seems construction season, summer, love, never lasts long enough. Okay, so construction season, just summer. What about spring and fall? Okay, maybe I'm nitpicking again. I'll stop. Even in a good year, summer speeds pass in a three-month flash from May, mid-May to mid-August. Yes, that's how summer works. In contrast to our long winter darkness, the blessed summer light creates a euphoria that runs through our veins. Hour after hour, there's still more time and more daylight to accomplish one more thing. If we told our kids to be home before dark, we wouldn't see them for weeks. This never-ending sun so elongates the days that by September, the newcomers to the state were ch 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 chica t chica coat? Okay, another caption say that they're exhausted enough to hibernate until spring. In the early 70s, after two years outside of Anchorage, my parents saved enough money to buy a little house an hour up the road in Montes... Monta Matsu. I'm just calling it by the nickname. I'll post another caption. There's a lot of weird names in this book.